that I'm here. Let me just begin by acknowledging that I'm currently uh, on the unceded uh, territory of the Ghanaian Gahaga Nation um, in uh, Jojage, what is commonly known as Montreal, Quebec. Um, before we continue, uh, let me just also provide a couple of logistics uh, to you. Um, the first is I'm going to ask you kindly to, uh, in the chat, write your name, uh, where you're coming from, so that we have a, a, an opportunity uh, to know uh, where everybody is at, at this moment. And please also add your pronouns um, if you feel so. Uh, we also have an opportunity to um, send questions to the members of parliaments with the question and answer box that you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom application. Uh, and uh, members of parliaments will be able to both answer these questions either by writing on the box or they could also uh, answer these questions when they will have the opportunity uh, to respond to the different questions that we have for, for, for them today. Alors, euh, aujourd'hui, si vous euh, le voulez, je, on, nous vous invitons à mettre votre nom, votre euh, euh, pronom et aussi euh, d'où vous venez, afin que, que l'on puisse savoir là où vous vous situez aujourd'hui. Si jamais vous avez des questions, on vous invite également à, les, euh, à utiliser la, la boîte à questions euh, de, de, de l'application Zoom et les députés se feront le plaisir de répondre soit par écrit ou soit par, euh, lorsqu'ils auront l'opportunité, ils et elles, auront l'opportunité de répondre aux questions que nous avons pour eux. Alors, sans plus tarder, please make honor to welcome to this forum on public uh, fossil fuel subsidies, Nathaniel uh, um, Erskine Smith uh, from the Liberal Party of Canada, Member of Parliament for Beaches East York, uh, Laurel Collins, Member of Parliament for the New Democratic Party of Canada for Victoria, uh, Madame Monique Rosé, qui est la députée du Bloc québécois, et la députée de Rapini, uh, and Mr. Mike Morris, um, uh, member parliament for the Green Party Kitchener Centre. Let's just go right into uh, the discussions. Uh, let me give you an overarching idea of the state play. We have had two reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. One says that climate inaction, climate pollution, and climate denial will make us poor, more vulnerable, and will uh, increase suffering. He actually, actually said that the powerful oil and gas lobby contributed for the past two decades to making us much more vulnerable to climate impacts, in particular because of the misinformation campaigns that they played. But still here in Canada, we continue to apply the principle of paying polluters for climate action and giving them generous tax credits instead of truly upholding the polluters pay principle. The latest IPCC report uh, that came out one month ago actually said that we have all the money, resources, and capacity to unlock the full potential of the energy transition. However, the federal government and its agencies provided $18 billion in 2020 to the oil and gas industry and to the benefits of oil and gas companies. You're part of a community charged to act on fossil fuel subsidies. And I want you to tell us what you have heard from the recent work you've done on subsidies in the environmental community. This is, I think, please correct me, the last day of that committee. So I'm really welcome uh, your thoughts on uh, why that committee matters, pourquoi c'est important de mettre fin aux énergies fossiles, et pourquoi le travail de ce comité-là pourrait avoir un impact pour les Canadiens et les Canadiens. J'aimerais commencer donc avec Madame la députée Laura Collins. Thank you so much, Eddie. And um, I'm also, I'm, I'm joining you today from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, and I just want to thank everyone so much for joining this really important conversation. Um, it was supposed to be our uh, last day of our fossil fuel subsidy. Actually, it got bumped. The minister came for the main estimate. So we'll be having our very last um, session of this, this study on Thursday. And you know, we have heard witness after witness uh, talking about how we're going to climate an emergency and how we cannot keep handing out billions of dollars to big oil and gas companies. You know, I think everyone who's joined here today understands the scale of the crisis we're facing. And we've been witnessing a record-breaking heat wave, ex extreme weather, intensifying wildfires. And, you know, people are worried. I, not to be honest, I had a, a bit of a hard day today and it feels really good to be in this room, um, joining you all for this conversation because it grounds me in what's important. You know, right now, the IPCC report is telling us it is now or never. You know, if we have any hope of securing a livable future, uh, if we want to protect the planet for our children and our grandchildren, you know, right now is the time for significant investments in the kind of proven climate solutions that we know are so desperately needed. Renewable energy, support for workers. Uh, but instead, what the government has been doing is handing over billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, it's our money, uh, to the same fossil fuel companies who are fueling the climate crisis. It's wild that Canada has provided more public financing to fossil fuels than 
any other G20 country, you know, averaging $14 billion annually between 2018 and 2020. And this is at the same time that these oil companies are making record profits and their CEOs are getting millions, you know, tens of millions of dollars in bonuses. Uh, these companies should be paying to clean up their own pollution. Uh, they shouldn't be paid by the government to continue to pollute. Um, you know, but it's not just that we are subsidizing these companies who are fueling the climate crisis. It's also that as we subsidize them, we are diverting scarce resources away from the solutions that are available and that we need. You know, in the middle of a climate emergency, the government gave 14 times more to the oil and gas industry than it gave to renewable energy. It's the exact opposite of what the IPC is saying, IPCC is saying we need to do. Um, we've yet to see any real significant action when it comes to supporting workers and communities who are gonna be impacted by the shift to the low carbon economy. We haven't seen the Just Transition uh, Act tabled yet. Um, and in the study that I've spearheaded on uh, the Committee for Environment and Sustainable Development, you know, we've just heard again and again how we need to not only get rid of subsidies, but all public financing and financial supports uh, provided to the oil and gas sector, because this is delaying action on reducing our emissions. And that includes the CCUS tax credit for folks who don't know CCUS is carbon capture, utilization and storage. And yes, this is a subsidy. Um, and this has been a topic in our, our um, committee study where we've heard experts, you know, economists, as well as climate scientists tell us that, you know, putting money into unproven technology development um, and funneling that money through profitable oil and gas companies is the wrong approach. Um, and while I was really glad to see the government uh, accelerate their promise, so move it from 2025 to 2023, it is hard to believe their promises when the biggest line item in the most recent budget uh, in the climate section is a new subsidy. It's a billions of dollars to carbon capture and storage that's going to be handed out to oil and gas companies. You know, we cannot afford more delays. We can't afford to continue to put everything that we value at risk. The cost is too high. And so I just, I'm so glad to be here with you all today. I've been calling on the government to eliminate all fossil fuel subsidies by the end of this year, redirect those funds to a just transition, redirect those funds to climate solutions, and let's make formal and binding commitments not to do, introduce any new fossil fuel subsidies. Ensure that we keep below 1.5. Thank you everyone for participating today. Really looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Merci, Madame Collins. Monsieur Maurice, um, à votre tour. Merci, Ali. Euh, dans la Chambre des communes, c'est vraiment rare que le Parti vert vont deuxième. So I'm surprised. Uh, thanks. Happy to go ahead, though. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks so much, Laurel, for your efforts to organize this and to Climate Action Network and, uh, and Eddie for your part in moderating. Um, we have some wonderful folks with us tonight, uh, one of whom is an author that I've been reading. Some of the folks have, uh, are probably aware of Seth Klein's book, A Good War. Seth, good to see you with us tonight. I want to start by sharing some research that uh, Seth shares in A Good, a Good War. Uh, this is research from 2017, so it's not new. I think the IPCC reports are very striking for us to call to mind. Uh, so from 2017, if we want a 50% chance so, you know, a moderate chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and Canada were to do its fair share of what remains of the global carbon budget, 86% of Canada's proven fossil fuel reserves need to remain unextracted. That's just the science. That's the reality of what we face. And while, you know, in my seven or so months in parliament, I've seen other wins. Uh, Nate, for example, has been fantastic. We've been working together on making progress on a guaranteed income for folks with disabilities. When it comes to climate, it just feels like one loss after another. 
uh, particularly on fossil fuel subsidies. It almost feels like it's just, and, and, and to be super clear, the four people on this in this conversation have been ch uh, uh, champions I've seen at every turn. So not for the leadership of, of those on this call, it seems like it's just fossil fuel subsidies under any other name. So back in December, some folks might have heard about this emissions reduction fund um, that actually led to increased uh, oil and gas production. Uh, you heard Laurel mention um, the largest line item in the, in the climate action plan. Um, it's, it's over $7 billion over the next, uh, until 2030. In, in what civil society. I think Julia Levin is here with us tonight as well. Um, she and, and hundreds of others have been calling out to say, this is just another subsidy to oil and gas. And so uh, that's, that's the concern we need to continue to be raising that, um, you know, what hope do we have for a safe climate future if at this point in the game, uh, rather than investing in the supports that workers need in a, in a just transition um, and in retraining and all the rest. And instead, we're giving it to foreign owned oil and gas companies to continue the same old, same old, or investing in new infrastructure like Beidzunag off the coast of Newfoundland. Um, and, and so I guess, yeah, similar to Laurel, I'm encouraged by conversations like these where we can come together to um, try to find strategies for ways forward. Uh, because if I'm honest, some of my most difficult days uh, have been related to um, the uh, not even lack of progress. It almost feels we're going backwards on uh, investments in, uh, in fossil fuels um, and, and, and in subsidies specifically. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Um, let's welcome Mr. Ernskin Smith uh, for a quick four minutes uh, on introdu introductory remarks. Well, thanks, Eddie. And I would start by saying a special thank you to Laurel for pulling this together. Uh, Laurel is someone who I've been able to work with together to actually really strengthen the Climate Accountability Act in the last parliament. And I always think of climate action and climate advocacy really via the lens of accountability, which we've achieved in a serious way in the last parliament ambition, and we can argue about whether the ambition is sufficient, but we've seen increased ambition, and that Climate Accountability Act requires the government to reconsider its ambition no later than 2025, so we will hopefully have more serious ambition leading into 2025 with one final five-year carbon budget heading into 2030, but we see that ambition ratchet up, certainly since, since I've been in politics since 2015. And lastly, climate action, and we have seen, you know, I don't want, I'm not going to be a shill for the government on this file, but I actually come to this with greater climate optimism, I would say, than my colleagues have articulated, though I will also be critical near the, the end of my remarks here. But when we look at uh, one of the world leading carbon pricing regimes in terms of its own ambition, when we see the rules around phasing out coal fired electricity and the action actually in partnership with the NDP government that previously existed in Alberta uh, under Rachel Notley, but there's serious action on that front that has contributed a great difference to the decline we see in projected 2030 emissions, which when we first took office were 815 megatons. And if we believe budget 2021, they would sit at 468 megatons if all policy measures hold. And those policy measures include strong methane reduction rules, the ZEV strategy, retrofit strategy, I could go on and on. But I will say that there is real criticism on two fronts, I would say. And, and, and one is the scale of action does not yet meet the ambition that we need to see. And so in recent conversations with the minister, I've certainly said, you know, it's great. We have this goal to get to 40 to 45%, but we know that's not going to be enough. And so let's see the modeling of, of what more is going to be needed to get where we truly need to get. And let's start really pushing our climate advocacy efforts where, where the gaps are. And yes, it will require dollars and cents. And in some cases require new regulatory uh, systems, including, uh, as we've committed to, uh, a cap on oil and gas emissions, a declining cap on oil and gas emissions consistent with net zero by 2050. And there is much work that has gone into the recent emissions reduction plan. And I guess the, the greatest criticism I would level in relation to fossil fuel subsidies, and I would, you know, we could delve into a, I, 
Laurel studied it more than I have at committee, but we could we could quibble, I think, about what amounts to uh, when we hear the number 17 to 18 billion dollars in the the uh, one of the past years. I, I don't see a wage subsidy that is across the board as a fossil fuel subsidy, but I do worry a great deal about fossil fuel subsidies and the government's plan previously when I but I, I was pulling up an old email in advance of this. And in January, 2017, I said, what's the plan on phasing out fossil fuel subsidies? And I got back a line from finance to say, we are committed to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies by the end of 2024. That is not a plan. Now we do have a renewed commitment and, and thanks to many advocates, both inside and outside of our caucus and, and across party lines. So we have a renewed commitment to not only, I, was, I would emphasize three, but phase out fossil fuel subsidies by 2023, by next year. I know Laurel was pushing for it even earlier, but by 2020, no later than 2023, we have a commitment to develop a plan. So a lot of advocacy and a lot of, I would say, uh, accountability needs to be brought to bear to this promise, which is to develop a plan to phase out public financing of the fossil fuel sector, including from crown corporations, consistent with our commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And then as you saw at COP26, ending public financing for overseas projects by the end of 2022 this year. Now I would say great accountability needs to be brought to bear because actually that public financing that is that is worrisome at the federal level in a, in a more serious way. And, and, and I would emphasize in the course of this criticism, the language of opportunity costs, which Laurel hinted at, right? Like if we weren't spending money on this, what could we spend the money on otherwise? And when we see TMX, which is going to be I think on all economic analyses, it's not going to be uh, a worthwhile economic investment. And certainly look at the opportunity costs of, of the magnitude of that public financing that could have been spent elsewhere. Uh, and then look at EDC in particular. So not traditional fossil fuel subsidies, which on IISD's analysis work out to somewhere between four to five billion at the federal level on an annual basis, but and, and those to be phased out. But look at EDC, which is a huge line item in comparison and it is a matter of public finance, so not seen to be a subsidy in quite the same way, but truly is as it relates to opportunity costs. And so we, from across party lines, including in our Liberal caucus, but outside of Liberal caucus too, we need everyone to really bring great account accountability to bear to make sure that these promises that have been made in relation to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, but also in relation to tackling the public finance of the fossil fuel sector, that these are brought to fruition and brought to fruition as quickly as possible. And then we see that spending move to a place where, as Laurel's mentioned, the $2 billion futures fund that we committed in this past election platform is not going to be enough. And yet we haven't seen it in the budget yet. I expect we'll see the just transition legislation this fall. And then hopefully in the next budget, we'll see it fully funded. But we are going to have to all raise our voices to make sure that this federal government and all levels of government spend a great deal more because we know that spending now will benefit not only us, but our our kids and future generations, jobs of today, but but certainly our kids' lives going forward. Thank you so much for that, uh, those words. Uh, Madame Posé, uh, donnez-nous votre avis sur uh, l'état des choses actuellement. Oui, mais d'abord, moi aussi, je vais commencer par remercier Laurel euh, d'avoir organisé cette soirée. Puis quand on voit quand même, il y a au-delà d'une centaine de participants, alors ça veut dire que ça touche quand même beaucoup de gens. Euh, je ne vais pas euh, revenir au comité, je vais revenir avant le comité à la COP26. Alors, à la COP26, c'était la première fois que dans un texte de l'ONU, on nommait les choses par son nom et il était écrit qu'on doit éliminer les subventions aux combustibles fossiles et au charbon. Euh, Est-ce qu'on est content que ça ait pris autant d'années pour inscrire ces mots-là? Mais au-delà des mots, ça prend des actions. Et des actions, bien, quand on regarde les chiffres, Eddie, tu as donné des chiffres. Ce que je lis des fois, ça part de 4, quelques milliards à 14, milliards euh, et même plus. C'est très difficile de chiffrer euh, l'ensemble des subventions qui vont aux entreprises. Euh, D'ailleurs, je pense que c'est la raison pour laquelle Laurel avait amené cette motion-là à discuter au comité. Mais on se rend compte que ce n'est pas, pas évident parce que des fois, il y a des allègements fiscaux. Des fois, il y a du financement dans des, à travers des projets d'infrastructure. Euh, des fois, il y a des subventions en recherche et développement. Alors, il y a plein de choses à regarder et on n'est pas capable de mettre le doigt sur le, un, un chiffre exact et précis. Par contre, 
Moi, tout ce que j'ai pu lire, il y avait un chiffre qui est revenu toujours le même, c'est que le Canada euh, mettait 14 fois et demi plus d'aide au secteur pétrogazier qu'aux énergies renouvelables. Alors là, on a un problème parce que, je veux dire, on veut combattre les changements climatiques, mais en même temps, on finance le secteur qui en produit le plus. Alors, on, on essaie de faire une transition vers des énergies propres, mais on donne de l'argent à leurs concurrents, à, leur, à, à ceux qui les compétitionnent. Alors, il y a de quoi qui ne va pas de taxer la pollution, ça c'est correct, de taxer la pollution, la taxe carbone, mais en même temps, on subventionne les pollueurs. Alors, j'ai le goût de vous dire, on fait un pas en avant, en taxant avec la taxe carbone, puis on fait un pas en arrière euh, en continuant à subventionner les pollueurs par du soutien public ou, ou quoi que ce soit. Euh, vous savez, moi, je pense que euh, c'est difficile, mais il y a, on essaie de trouver le chemin vers ça. Ce qu'on sait, par contre, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup trop d'argent qui est donné aux énergies fossiles. Puis moi, je n'ai pas de problème à ce que l'industrie euh, essaie toutes sortes de choses nouvelles, de technologies nouvelles comme la capture et, et le stockage de carbone, que l'industrie essaie, l'industrie, elle a l'argent. Vraiment, là, euh, le, dans une question d'ailleurs que j'ai posée euh, à celui qui représentait l'Association canadienne des produits pétroliers, en lui disant, mais pourquoi vous ne mettez pas l'argent? Et il m'a répondu, on n'est pas capable. Nous, le secteur privé, on n'est pas capable de mettre de l'argent. Ben voyons donc, Laurel l'a dit tantôt, dans son mot d'ouverture, il y a des millions qui donnent aux actionnaires. Alors, que l'industrie essaie des choses avec leur argent, mais l'argent des contribuables, il doit aller vers des sources d'énergie renouvelable qui sont déjà là, qu'on connaît déjà. <coughs> Je terminerai parce qu'il y avait une question tantôt dans le chat par rapport aux subventions efficaces ou subventions inefficaces. Alors, en 2009, si je me rappelle bien, euh, avec le G20, euh, le Canada s'était engagé à éliminer les subventions inefficaces. <coughs> Excusez-moi. Donc, euh, j'imagine qu'en 2009, il y avait peut-être une raison à, à, se, à se poser cette question-là, subvention inefficace versus subvention efficace. Mais rendu en 2022, où on a trois ans pour agir si on veut maintenir le 1,5, je pense qu'on n'a plus à se battre pour des définitions. Toute subvention, à mon avis, est inefficace puisqu'elle va vers des énergies qui font des gaz à effet de serre, qui et j'aimerais que les gens s'en rappellent, a une influence sur notre santé. La crise climatique, elle est étroitement liée à une crise sanitaire. Je vais m'arrêter là. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Mme Posé. Uh, thank you all for those very uh, important remarks. Uh, maybe just uh, a, a quick comment on logistics. Unfortunately, uh, the organizers were not able to get the translation. So we have agreed that uh, members of parliament can speak on the language of uh, your choice. Si les députés souhaitent parler soit en anglais et en français, ils sont libres de le faire. Pour ma part, je m'engage donc à, à, à m'assurer que les questions qui sont posées euh, le sont uh, à la fois en anglais et en français. Uh, and so I will, I will be translating the questions from English to French. Um, donc, um, essentially, something that is clear from your discussions is that there is optimism that something needs to happen and that you're engaged into it. But at the same time, uh, there, are, there is a sense of frustration because of the delay in tackling um, uh, this issue. The fact that even right now with the energy crisis that we're facing, governments are again subsidizing oil and gas while not focusing in tackling the vulnerabilities that this uh, war in, in Ukraine is showing across energy security issues, food security issues, and the fact that we're tackling uh, a climate emergency. Madame Posé, je vais commencer avec vous pour vous demander um, un peu plus sur la question de la responsabilisation. 
Euh, plus de 30 000 personnes se sont prononcées contre le crédit d'impôt euh, pour le, euh, le soutien au captage du, aux technologies de captage du carbone. Euh, puis, en, en fait, euh, la question que j'ai, c'est ben, comment, comment, comment le résultat du travail euh, va contribuer en fait, à, 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 à mettre fin à l'absence de responsabilité, de responsabilisation de la part du gouvernement du Canada. How will these committees work to uh, contribute to ending the lack of accountability that exists in the context of subsidies? How long will it take until um, we, we tackle that uh, lack of accountability problem? Madame Posey. Alors, c'est toute une question. Euh, le comité a étudié pendant quatre séances, il en reste une. Là, il y aura un rapport. Mais ce que je déplore du comité, c'est qu'il y a des, euh, des témoins qui sont venus nous dire le contraire de ce que j'ai lu partout. Alors, à un moment donné, c'est la crédibilité des témoins que moi, j'ai mis en doute. Euh, il y a un témoin, par exemple, qui nous a dit que les énergies propres, les énergies renouvelables étaient beaucoup plus dispendieuses que les énergies fossiles. Or, depuis des années, tout ce que j'ai pu lire, c'est le contraire. C'est de dire que les énergies euh, renouvelables, bien, de plus en plus, elles baissent, elles baissent et elles sont maintenant presque moitié, entre peut-être pas moitié, mais elles sont beaucoup moins euh, dispendieuses que les énergies euh, fossiles. Alors, c'est difficile, je trouve, euh, au sein du comité, quand j'entends des, des, des témoins dire des choses comme ça qui vont vraiment à l'encontre de ce, tout ce que j'ai pu lire. Alors, il y, a, il y a un problème de crédibilité. Maintenant, euh, il y aura un rapport et le ministre a... X nombre de jours, là, il y a plusieurs mois avant de nous déposer sa réponse au rapport, mais je pense que dans euh, ce qui va être euh, primordial pour Laurel, pour moi, pour, pour tout le monde, c'est que dans le rapport, ce soit des choses qui soient vraies, qui soient justes. Il y a un défi là et euh, je pense que c'est la même chose pour tous les rapports. Uh, merci beaucoup de poser. Uh, I have a, then we, we're, we're getting a lot of questions about, um, uh, you know, the fact that Canada has never reached, uh, Stephen Crozier saying Canada has never reached its greenhouse gas emission targets. To me, um, it's obvious why this continues to happen. Uh, and, you know, the, the government's approach, it has been to subsidize the fossil fuel companies. Uh, and, and so I guess, you know, this sense that uh, meeting climate targets and ending fossil fuel subsidies uh, goes side by side. Um, Mr. Ernskin Smith, I'm curious uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about the, how does it fit this current uh, foul objective to end subsidies in the current context of the energy crisis? Uh, how are these two issues uh, uh, together? And do you think this is an opportunity to actually accelerate action on subsidies as we go through this um, you know, geopolitical uh, crisis linked to, to, to the uh, Ukraine war? Well, first, unquestionably, it emphasizes the need for energy security, including for the EU and including for the United States, including for ourselves. And, and that, that is in many ways, especially going forward, dependent upon cleaner electricity and cleaner energy. And so I think we are lucky in Canada to have the clean electricity grid that we have, but it needs to be cleaner and we need to move more quickly towards that goal. And certainly when you look at the dependence upon fossil fuels from, and, and the challenge, right, the geopolitical challenge right now in Germany, I, th I think we would all be better off if, if we expedited the conversation and the expedited the transition. Uh, and so I think that that is all obvious on its face, and I, and I hope that it provides greater political impetus to take action via the transition. I'm not always convinced it will. When you look at conservative colleagues, at least, unfortunately, we don't have a conservative colleague here, but not much of a surprise. But the, the other thing I would say is immediately in the wake of, of, of this geopolitical and, and challenge and the uh, unconscionable war of aggression, we saw conservatives put forward a motion on the floor of the House to say that we should actually, the, the answer is building more pipelines and, and more fossil fuel development. We'll just export those fossil fuels to the EU. And, and there's no timeline where that makes sense, right? There's absolutely no timeline where that makes sense. The answer is obviously expedited transition, as you say. But uh, I, I suppose 
Uh, the last thing I'll say though is on the question of targets because, uh, and this is where I, I'm probably more optimistic, but when I look at the curve and, and I, don't only, I don't only look at the targets that have been set and missed by liberal governments under Chrétien and Martin and then missed by, and, and obviously missed by, by Harper, but when we took office, we, I, I think, have come a significant way, not, not far enough. I think that's where criticism ought to lie, but certainly much significant action. And to the point that the previous target, an insufficient target, albeit, but the previous target was 512 megatons. Now we have gotten to a place where the policy action is such that we, we are going to meet that target and then, and then some. And so we need a more ambitious target. And now we have a more ambitious target closer to uh, 430 megatons or so. And so we have to meet that too, and then ramp up the ambition all over again. And so I, I this idea of nev never meeting a target, I think is a, is a bit of a bit of a distraction in some ways. The, the emphasis has to be, are we going to put the climate action into place to get to where we need to get, not, not this necessary incrementalism to say, well, you know, pat ourselves on the back for meeting the Harper targets or pat ourselves on the back for hitting 40%. We need modeling that shows us where we need to get, where the gaps are, and then we need to push this government to go as quickly as we can to get there. And, and so we've seen progress, that's great, but we can't rest on, on that progress. We, we have to demand greater action and greater ambition. Uh, and I guess the last thing, just um, this, I, I saw in the chat this question of efficient versus inefficient. In our, in our most recent platform, we've just said we are going to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, though I would differ from my colleagues, Mike and, and Laurel a little bit, when I look at CCUS, which is budgeted for 2.6 billion or so over the next five years, I'm a vegan and I would say, look, if we have an investment tax credit in cellular agriculture or plant-based foods, I'm going to be supportive of that. Maybe I can force you know, Tyson and Cargill to pay more into the system, sure. But as a general principle, that means these companies and others have an incentive to invest in a space that is a positive space. And I take the point that the technologies are not as proven yet, but my view is it's all hands on deck, all investments needed, all opportunities to explore. And again, the criticism, which I think Laurel identified correctly, is opportunity cost, right? If we're not spending everything we need to spend everywhere else, then I get the argument to say, well, we're spending a disproportionate amount of CCUS. But my general view is we should spend on all of these things at a much greater scale. Thank you so much. Um, and then, I mean, I think that really links into... Uh, it is it is a cost benefit analysis, but it's also prioritization. If the IPCC is telling us that uh, we need, uh, we have all the resources at hand, and then the question is, how are we using these resources? And so I'm just moving uh, to you, Mike. Um, um, Je voudrais juste peut-être entrer une autre dimension. C'est la question de l'équité, la question aussi sociale, uh, parce que elle est elle est aussi fondamentale. Um, and, and, you know, when we talk about climate targets and we talk about 1.5, we talk about a mitigation target, right? Uh, but rarely we talk about adaptation as a target or even finance as a target. Here, uh, fossil fuel subsidies is a misalignment on climate finance. That's what the IPCC is saying. Um, I'm curious, how do we insert here this critical piece on equity? equity towards actually giving us uh, ourselves the resources that we need to pay for the energy transition, an energy transition, an ecological transition that actually works for, for people. Alors, quels sont, en fait, que, comment est-ce qu'on applique la dimension de l'équité euh, dans ce débat-là, qui nous permet à, de réfléchir sur les façons dont on peut, en fait, financer la transition énergétique et écologique, une transition pour les gens, euh, une transition qui tient en considération des besoins des gens. Yeah, thanks for the question, Eddie, um, because as you, as you might know, this was one of my big reflections coming out of COP26, uh, was the importance of centering climate justice in this conversation. If we're going to recognize, I'm sure many of you have had this similar conversation and someone will say, well, what does it matter? What do Canada's emissions matter as compared to, and they'll say, whatever, name the country, India, China, etc. And the reality is, what the reason it matters is that per capita, we have disproportionately emitted in ways that are disproportionately impacting across the global south. And now we are part of tables at uh, UN uh, ne negotiations 
where we are then expecting countries like India, for example, to not make the same mistakes that we made and then chastise them for considering investing in coal and kind of doing this kind of holier than thou type of thing. Um, when in reality, we then also turn back and say, oh yeah, and when it comes to the losses and, and damages that you're incurring as a result of our emissions, we don't want to talk about that. And so unless we're going to have a meaningful, nuanced conversation about the reality that uh, this is not some kind of progressive ideology, this is just the reality of the global negotiations required on the climate crisis, that we need to recognize uh, justice in the UN negotiating process for those that followed uh, that back at COP26. This is exactly what uh, countries like India were, were saying. And, you know, others, ourselves included, were, are, are, are continuing to, uh, to not give much attention to. Um, and so it's part of what's kind of disconcerting to me is because we're stuck in this conversation here about inefficient and efficient subsidies. And Nate, I am so, I really deeply appreciate you being a part of this conversation because it's a place where we can you know, disagree respectfully, right? This is what our democracy needs more of. It's one of the things I find most difficult going into the, the, the House of Commons every day is, is that it just seems like we've lost an ability Laurel tried proposing a motion today to seek unanimous consent on ending subsidies. And the kind of like just negativity that came back um, is, is the exact opposite of what I think this conversation is. I deeply believe that carbon capture is a false solution, that the, the 2.6 billion is exactly the funds that we should be using in, in more proven solutions that'll get reductions quicker. But, you know, I can appreciate you know, where you're coming from, Nate, and forums like this that allow for that conversation to be had are what are gonna help us make more progress more, uh, more quick, quickly. So for the sake of time, if it's okay, Eddie, I'll share the blog post in the chat uh, with respect to the need to center global equity and climate justice in this conversation. Please do, please do. I think uh, uh, everyone will be really happy to see that link and, and it is a moment for all of you to also share the work that you're doing uh, individually to advance this file so do not hesitate uh, but I want to go uh, uh, to, to Mrs. Collins right now um, and ask you a, a, a fundamental question which is how do we ensure this process leads to getting all energy projects including those benefiting from government support that are to uphold indigenous rights and are fully aligned with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and its principles of free prior and informed consent. I think you know this is a critical element. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Canada um, it, within its colonial um, uh, history has uh, uh, brought the dependence of fossil fuels in northern territories. And, and as we look at the transition, but also as we look at how uh, indigenous peoples are on the front lines of the climate crisis, but also facing the greatest threats, this is a particular issue uh, that I want to get your views on as we consider the resource out of, um, of, of um, the, the, the ability to pay for, for this transition for them, uh, from their perspective. So, how can we ensure that we can que euh, les projets énergétiques euh, et ceux qui, qui, qui obtiennent en fait euh, du soutien public puissent tenir en considération des droits des peuples autochtones, euh, qu'ils soient liés en fait avec la déclara déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits euh, des peuples autochtones. Eddie, thank you so much for that critically important question. And I think, yeah, it's important to remember not only the history of our country, which is the displacement and colonization of uh, the First Peoples, you know, Inuit, Métis, First Nations communities, uh, who for generations have been uh, impacted by colonialism, and the ongoing um, work that is happening right now today, continuing to displace 
uh, land defenders continuing to push forward resource, resource projects without the consent of the communities whose land uh, those projects are on. Um, and so, you know, first and foremost, when it comes to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, this can't be a empty promise. It can't be a commitment that doesn't fundamentally transform the way our federal government addresses every piece of legislation that we have. And that is particularly important when it comes to natural resources. And uh, I was reminded this morning, I um, spent the first part of my morning um, taking part in a dream catcher um, creation. And uh, the, the man who is facilitating um, Will is Ojibwe. And he reminded us that the federal government had Indigenous affairs, uh, you know, first uh, Aboriginal affairs and natural resources together in one ministry before, that these two things have been connected for the federal government because it has been a tool to both oppress Indigenous communities and extract resources at the expense of these communities. So a, in this moment, as we are handing over billions of dollars to profitable oil and gas companies who are benefiting from that extraction, from that uh, taking of land from Indigenous communities, it is imperative, it is a moral imperative that we ensure that money is returned to those communities, that also we are providing the kinds of economic supports that do not force communities to choose between poverty and a project that is going to destroy their home and put their community and their health at risk. Uh, because this is what we see again and again and again. Uh, so as we have this conversation about how we're going to spend subsidy, you know, the subsidy money, hopefully we can eliminate the fossil fuel subsidies first. Um, but we need to ensure that all of that money is directed at climate solutions and at just, um, you know, climate justice that is fundamentally grounded in the rights uh, of Indigenous peoples. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Um, yeah, I, I, I like us to move to the last section of this panel as you know, time is, is coming to an end really quickly. Um, and I'm going to follow parliament procedure. So I'll begin with uh, Mr. Ernstine Smith uh, here, uh, but um, you know, it, it, critically, uh, there is this whole of society, whole of parliament approach to subsidies. Maybe the conservative did not accept come to this town hall, but um, you know, I think uh, the majority of, of major political parties are on board that this is something that could get buy-in from all political views here in Canada. And that is that matters. Um, and I want to get your commitment. Uh, uh, it, it, in this uh, discussion about the way forward, because the IPCC is calling for urgent increase in climate cooperation. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the first uh, question that I have uh, for you is, you know, um, uh, Canada has a fair share obligation under the Paris Agreement. We have an obligation to contribute to limiting global warming um, to, uh, to 1.5. So what is it that uh, you can do together to then uh, not only put forward strict conditions to government support in the context of the energy transition, but how do we also make sure that phasing out subsidies is done following a whole of parliament and whole of society approach? That kind of whole of society momentum that requires strong accountability from the parliament, but also from the government. Uh, so that's a big question. I'm not sure I've got a great answer, but I would say that as a starting point, you need more conversations like this of folks work, working across party lines. And so I, I think that, you know, if Mike Laurel and Monique were in charge of climate policy, it would, it would move even faster. And that would be a good thing. And I'm glad that Laurel is I'm glad that there's the Liberal NDP collaboration in this parliament in a more serious way. I'm glad Laurel is helping to oversee that and bring that accountability from her side, at least. And I would also say, you know, look, I've got a ton of respect for Jonathan Wilkinson. I think he's in 
the, he has been in the right portfolio when he was the environment minister. He's, he's now in a really serious portfolio when it comes to natural resources to ensure that this transition happens in a serious way. Uh, I think Stephen Gilbo, obviously, come, I, I don't know him as well personally, but he comes with uh, a, a lifetime of climate advocacy as well. So those two individuals are well placed. And we need everyone from all parties to, to push within their own caucuses and frankly, all Canadians to push to make sure that we we do our part. And doing our part can mean a number of different things, right? So doing our part certainly as it relates to reducing emissions, doing our part to ensure that affected communities. And so there's not a ton of liberal representation out in Alberta, Saskatchewan, but workers in Alberta and Saskatchewan need to be looked after in the course of the transition. And that's a really serious part of this conversation too, domestically. And then internationally, when you talk about fair share and, and Paris, I have to emphasize in my own advocacy, I have turned greater attention to most recently global vaccine equity, but in the context of international climate finance, if you look at that $100 billion USD a year commitment is what it's supposed to be, an annual commitment, uh, Canada is nowhere close to spending $4 billion American every single year on international climate finance. And we spend, we pat ourselves on the back, actually. You, you will hear me and other colleagues say, well, we've doubled our international climate finance from 2.6 to 5.2 billion. And that's great, but that's not, that's not in a single year. That's over a number of years. And so we are not nearly doing enough when we talk about fair share. We are not nearly, nearly doing enough. And so I think, look, the, we're here today about fossil fuel subsidies. I would, again, emphasize public finance because fossil fuel subsidies are one piece of this, but public finance is a massive opportunity cost that's, that's going to be that we need to address in a serious way and now, but this is one part of the picture, right? And we need to care about this, we need to deliver on this, and there needs to be accountability to make sure the government delivers on this. Uh, but we also need to continue to work across party lines to make sure we do much more than just that, because that is not going to be enough, enough either to get where we need to get. Thank you, merci. On va passer à, à Madame poser la même question sur l'importance de la coopération de la collaboration pour faire en sorte que ce dossier-là soit un qui concerne en fait tout le Parlement, mais aussi toute la société, tenant en considération de l'importance de plus de responsabilisation. Euh, comment est-ce qu'on s'assure en fait que, que ce dossier puisse appuyer ou mener à un renforcement urgent de la coopération climatique? Euh, de votre côté, en fait, euh, de, de la part du Bloc québécois, quel est votre engagement là-dessus? Oui, alors euh, merci. Euh, mais je vais être d'accord avec ce que Nathalie disait. Tu sais, c des, ce sont des questions qui sont transpartisanes. Et euh, ça, c'est important. Et d'ailleurs, je reconnais euh, l'activité de ce soir comme étant une de ces actions-là qui peuvent cheminer. Maintenant, quand on parle, comment on peut faire pour que la société, pour que les citoyens euh, se sentent appelés par ça? Écoutez, je vais être pas fine, là, mais j'ai le goût de vous dire que quand euh, les gouvernements, on, quand on dit que la planète brûle et qu'on voit que les gouvernements, peu importe le niveau, là, provincial, Québec, province ou le fédéral, prennent des décisions qui vont à l'encontre de ce que les scientifiques nous disent, ben moi, je comprends les citoyens de ne pas trop en faire de ne pas trop nous croire, parce que les actions ne suivent pas les paroles. Mais là où j'ai un espoir, je ne veux quand même pas vous laisser sur le désespoir, là où il y a un espoir, je pense que c'est au niveau des villes. Parce que les villes, on le sait, sont des, des, euh, des gouvernements de proximité. Euh, je pense qu'il y, y a des villes comme Laval, par exemple, qui a décidé qu'il n'y aurait plus de glyphosate. Euh, nulle part. Euh, il y a des villes comme Mascouche, comme Terrebonne qui vont éliminer tout ce qui est sac de plastique. Montréal va le faire dans un an. Euh, et, et ça, c'est par des pressions souvent citoyennes. Aujourd'hui, j'étais au sommet climat de Montréal et euh, toutes les idées qui venaient à la fois des gens de la finance, des gens des entreprises privées, des euh, groupes communautaires et des citoyens mettaient ensemble pour avoir une ville qui soit, euh, qui soit plus agréable à vivre, dans le fond, euh, qui n'est pas des îlots de chaleur. Alors, je, moi, je pense vraiment que l'espoir, il est au niveau des municipalités. Merci, Madame Posé. Mike Morris, same question. Um, I mean, the, the, the required cooperation, but also taking it a little bit further towards, um, you know, 
who do we need to cooperate with? I mean, we talked a lot about the fact that the strong oil and gas lobbies, they have had influence into climate policy, but how do we move forward to make sure that uh, this file increases accountability there uh, while at the same time brings um, uh, Canadians towards a, a collective vision, transfor transformative vision of public finance, um, beginning by tackling public subsidies and subsidies per se. Well, maybe this is where we need to talk about proportional representation, because if we look at the supply and confidence agreement, that is kind of the best offer possible between well-intentioned liberal and NDP folks and not for, I'm sure, the leadership that I'm sure Laurel and Nate showed in their caucuses. I think many on this call would agree we need to do far more on climate and we would see more of that if we had the you know whatever 60 some odd percent of Canadians were demanding more climate action if that was represented in our parliament and so I think we're doing you're seeing parliament play out as well as it can under first past the post and I'm appreciative, you know, dental care, for example, the fact that that's in this budget, that's the result of parliamentarians working together uh, to get things done. Uh, and if we were to move towards proportional representation, not only is PR inherently a more cooperative approach, and also we know that these ideas would then surface more. And so whether it's Fair Vote Canada or others, those that are feeling discouraged around climate action, I would encourage you to consider putting your efforts towards ensuring our, our democracy moves towards PR. Thank you, Mrs. Morrison. That's a great uh, comment for uh, our, um, our Liberal MP tonight uh, uh, that maybe he can be, bring back to the government. But I, I do want to end um, with uh, Mrs. Collins because uh, you have been, or you know, bring in this is this is your effort you were led the organization to this town hall uh and you're also leading uh a, 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 you know a leading voice bringing people together um uh to have this discussion from from a cross-partisan but also cross-sectoral um uh, uh, way and so uh what's what, what do you think needs to happen next uh so that we can continue building momentum what is for you in the context of increasing climate cooperation, the next uh, thing that we need to do um, to really get this down, uh, nailed down on subsidies uh, and increase climate action in Canada. Mm, thanks, Eddie. And yeah, maybe starting off just to acknowledge that I think the Canadian public is already there. You know, Canadians understand that fossil fuel subsidies do not make sense. Uh, they do not want their government handing over public money to profitable oil and gas companies. Um, and so thinking a little bit about why the government continues to do it. Uh, why is it that uh, so much of our money is being handed over to oil and gas companies? And I have asked a few of the witnesses kind of to speculate on, on why they think that is. Um, if anyone's interested, there is an amazing research um, project out of the University of Victoria. Um, it's called the Corporate Mapping Project. It shows the lobbying record of the oil and gas industry um, and really documents uh, the extreme influence that these companies have on our policymaking, on our bureaucrats, and on our politicians. And the oil and gas sector is eager to frame themselves as a willing partner in the fight to address the climate crisis, but they are not. They are constantly undermining our progress. And I think, and I know Nate probably won't agree with me on this, but I think CCUS is a perfect example of that. Julia Levin, I saw uh, in the chat. Hi, Julia. Thanks for all your work and for environmental defense and all the work that they do. Uh, she posted a link to buyer beware, and I really encourage everyone to go check out that report. Environmental uh, Defense did an incredible uh, report. And when it comes to CCUS, uh, this uh, there were 400 experts who urged the government not to create this tax credit, not to create another fossil fuel subsidy, or at bare minimum, to have the tax credit and exclude the oil and gas industry from it. The people making record profits, the ones handing out tens of millions of dollars to their CEOs, 
those companies can pay for it themselves. Government can regulate it themselves. Um, and while I have, you know, a respect for uh, the members across the way and uh, Minister Wilkinson, you know, he said that those people aren't experts when asking why he wouldn't meet with them. And these are climate scientists, they are economists, um, they are the people we should be listening to. But instead, this government is listening to the oil and gas lobby. And today, Minister Gilbo defended uh, this newest subsidy, carbon capture and storage, uh, citing the IPCC, when we also know that Canada lobbied the IPCC to change the text in the summary for policymakers to increase the importance of carbon capture. Uh, it is wild. Despite that lobbying, and they did, they were successful in changing some of the language, but despite that lobbying, the IPCC report was clear. Uh, carbon capture and storage is still the least effective and the most expensive option. So why, why would we put the biggest line item in the most recent budget headed towards carbon capture and storage that is funneled into those profitable oil and gas companies? And it is because of that very effective lobbying that the, the oil and gas sector has done. And so I think we need to address that. We need to mobilize around that and we need to increase the pressure on this Liberal government. Uh, you know, I am so proud to be part of the uh, historic deal, the what we're calling the Unhood Accord after Jagmeet's daughter, uh, one of the, the ways in which that this uh, negotiation started. And it's not just dental care, it's also there are commitments on uh, passing just transition language, there are commitments on low income retrofits. Uh, and no, it's definitely not everything that I wanted in there, definitely not everything that the NDP would do if we were in government. But this is what we could get from, you know, this is how far we could push the Liberals. And I have to agree with Mike that if we were in a proportional system, we would be getting better results. We also need to be fighting for proportional representation. Um, but yeah, maybe just to end with a huge, huge thank you to everyone on the call, especially uh, to all those folks who have been fighting so hard to end fossil fuel subsidies for bold climate action. Seth Klein is one of my heroes and that framing around, you know, matching the urgency and scale of the crisis. We need to act like we're in an emergency. We need to spend what it takes. We need to do everything in our power to ensure we have a livable future. Uh, so thanks to everyone. Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup, Laurel. Um, I just want to maybe say thanks to the four members of parliament for participating here. Uh, we live with um, a sense that, uh, that there is still ability for cooperation on this issue. Uh, there are many organizations in this call that have been working extremely hard to get the fossil fuel subsidies piece high in the political agenda. Et c'est aussi ces organisations-là qui mènent le combat afin d'accélérer l'action climatique à l'échelle canadienne. Uh, uh, un gros merci à tous les gens qui, qui nous accompagnent aujourd'hui. And uh, uh, yeah, also, Laurel, thanks to you and your team for making this happen as well. Uh, merci beaucoup à tout le monde et on se voit à la prochaine. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you, Kenrak.